Come and leave it there I was down With no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well And I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free I tried it for myself And now I know What he did for me Good morning, welcome to the
return. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. How many came to worship the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I came to see his face. Yeah.
God today. Grab your Bibles. I'm going to pray. We need the help of the anointing of God. There's a word from the Lord, and I want to go right into it today. Bow with me in a word of prayer. I, I, I covet your, your covering over me today. Father God, here we stand. Again, asking that we be used by such an awesome God. That, Lord, you would take the time to take someone like me and allow your word to come forward. Your word. So, God, I ask that as this word comes through me, move me out of the way. Touch someone's heart. Break down a stronghold. Let someone find freedom in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and I'm doing the good old King James this morning, uh, when I get into the word, there'll be a variation of translations, but I want to start here, and you hath he quickened, verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of our mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of work, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained, that we should walk in them. That 10th verse is where we're going to land our attention. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Today, for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, we're going to speak from this thought. You are God's masterpiece, flaws and all. We're going to talk about this subject of masterpiece and why the writer said that we are his workmanship. That word workmanship is translated as artwork and it's translated into a theme of us being God's masterpiece. Let's talk about it. What, what is a masterpiece? Let's, let's talk about it. Leonardo da Vinci is known as one of the greatest intellects that the world has ever known. Although he's known to be a great painter, it was not just his painting that he was renowned for. He was also renowned for his notebooks, what they discovered where he had all kind of intellectual, scientific uh, inventions within the notebook. As a matter of fact, a lot of the drawings in his notebook were futuristic. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was ahead of his time. He came about during the Renaissance period, but he was uh, the epitome of a Renaissance man. But Leonardo da Vinci in his notebooks had subjects such as uh, astrology and botany and paleontology and, I mean, just all kind of fields he got into that he had knowledge of. But still, the greatest thing he's known for is being a great artist. As a matter of fact, Leonardo da Vinci painted two great works that are considered the greatest works ever painted. The first one is the Mona Lisa. You're all familiar with that? The Mona Lisa is considered the most famous 
piece of art. It's considered the best work ever done. It's the most visited work ever done. It's the most sung about work ever done. It's the most parodied work ever done. When people talk about the Mona Lisa, it's in a class all by itself. It is a masterpiece done by Leonardo da Vinci. And then the second one is The Last Supper. It is a painting of Christ and his apostles as they are going through the Last Supper as portrayed in the gospel in the book of John. And both of these, uh, even this painting is the most copied religious painting that there is. And both of these are considered masterpieces. They're masterpieces, watch this, not because, well, a masterpiece is considered a masterpiece because of the skill the intellectual knowledge and the artistry of the master, the skill, intellectual knowledge and artistry of the master, but also the masterpiece is not a masterpiece because of the brilliance of the piece, it's a masterpiece because of the master who created it. So Mona Lisa and the Last Supper are both considered masterpieces because of the work of Leonardo da Vinci. Well, here's the good news. I got news today, great news, that we are considered the masterpieces of God. In that 10th verse of this second chapter of our text, that word workmanship is the Greek word poemai, and it actually means poem or artistry. In the Greek, it means a workmanship or a piece of art or a piece of a masterpiece that was created. And God is the one who created us, so we are God's masterpieces. I know we got flaws. I know we got problems, but I need you to know something today. I want you to raise the level of who you are because the good news in what I just said is not that we are a masterpiece, but that the masterpiece is only a masterpiece because the power to be a masterpiece comes from the master. So everything we have, everything we need, everything we will ever be, God already placed in us because he is a skilled, the most intellectual artist that ever did create something. God created us to be a masterpiece, not to be down here in bondage to things of this world, but to understand who it is that created us, how we are masterpiece. Listen to David in Psalms 139, verse 14. He said, I will praise you, O Lord. Watch it. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He said, uh, "All marvelous are your works, and my soul knows it right away. Look what David said. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He said, God crafted us. He did not just throw us together. David knew God built us piece by piece, put the gifts in we need, the strength in we need, the intelligence that we need, the destiny that we need. Everything God needed, listen to me somebody, is in you because God placed it in you because he was creating a masterpiece. He wasn't creating somebody that couldn't stand in the world. He wasn't creating somebody who was going to fall down every time the enemy came. He was not creating somebody who could not bounce back when trouble came. This morning, somebody better go with me and say, I'm a masterpiece. I got no business allowing myself to get down when God took his time and created me as a masterpiece from his own mind. You know what? God made a whole lot of folk. Isn't there something? There's no two of us alike. There's only one you. That right there should make identical twins aren't even identical. God said, and, and I don't know about you, but I would have run out of faces and noses and hands and everything. But God knows how to create all of us different and yet the same. You need to take pride in the fact that not that it's your power, but that the master has placed the power in you. What David said is I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He was talking about our physical body. Did you know that doctors have medicine and doctors have procedures, but it is our body that works in harmony with the doctor. A doctor couldn't do anything if our body, God hadn't created it to heal on its own. Think about something. Doctors say, go do this and take that for two weeks. They know that God's healing inside our body is going to kick in. Here's the stuff. They don't even know how it's going to kick in, but they know they have to 
cooperate with the masterpiece God has created. Now, you need the medicine, but don't ever think the medicine would work without the body doing what God created it to work. Dr. Paul Brand tells us how even something as simple as the mechanics in our hand shows that God created us a masterpiece. I mean, look at our hand. It, it can do all kinds of things. If you ever missed it, you would know that you missed your hand because it can go into all these positions and lift stuff and pick stuff and grab stuff. And he said, I can show you a thousand surgical textbooks where people have tried to emulate, try to copy the motions God gave with the hand, where they've done surgery after surgery, trying to work on the tendons and the muscles, trying to work on the joints in the hand to make it do what God says. He said, now, out of all those operations, I've never seen anybody improve on God's hand. They were not able to improve on what God had created in the hand. As a matter of fact, he said, just the motion of my thumb tells me that God is the creator of a masterpiece. We are physical masterpieces. And God said, if we cooperate with him, that this masterpiece of a body will be fine. Don't let yourself get too worried. Don't let yourself go too far. You were created to be a masterpiece in God. Not only that, but spiritually we were created to be spiritual masterpieces. If you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 27 it says, uh, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fowls of the air, over the beasts of the field, and over every creeping thing that it is. Here's what God said. I created man to have dominion. What? Dominion. What? God said, I never made you to fall prey to the things that are on this earth. You are supposed to have dominion. In your own house, take dominion over your circumstances. On your job, take dominion over your circumstances. God created us to be the head and not the tail. God created us to be above and not beneath. God never created you. Oh, I'm getting to somebody right now. You need to understand you are in a class all by yourself spiritually. We have spiritual power. What kind of spiritual power? God said, because we were created in his image and his likeness, the same force that God uses to create, he put in us. That's why we can speak words, not just any words. Every word that we speak has power in it. Words can, can carry feelings and words can carry depression and words can make you laugh and words can make you sad. But if we understand that once we put God's word in our hearts, mixed with our faith, when we speak for words, it comes out with power. Oh, I'm getting there now. I feel my help coming. Somebody doesn't understand. As I pray, it's because God's word is coming out of my mouth. As I pray, I speak what God said. I say what God says. God said I'm whole, then I'm whole. God said I'm well, then I'm well. I don't care what the circumstances say. Can I help somebody speak what God said? I'm going to take a break right now. I'm going to take about 10 seconds so you can start speaking over your own self. Come on. I don't know what it is you're going through. Speak over it. Yes, I'm going to be healed. I don't care what the circumstances say. Say, yes, I'm getting better. Yes, my finances are getting better. Yes, my family's getting better. Yes, my children's getting better. I am not supposed to be down. I'm supposed to be above. We have to speak what God said. Jesus Christ himself said in Mark's gospel, chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. Watch this. He was speaking to them and he said, have faith in God. For whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou uh, picked up and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe whatever he saith, he shall have what he saith. And watch this. And when you pray, believe what you say. And if you believe it and don't doubt, you shall have what you pray. Listen to God. He said we can speak and things happen. I'm telling somebody, we're masterpieces. We're walking around this earth with a power that God has placed in us that is a power that keeps us understanding that the master has created us to be able to handle every trial, every struggle, every problem that we'll ever go through. No, I'm not going to stop. I need you to see, wake up, get up. Don't sit there like that when you've been created as God's masterpiece. We need to be able to, and you know what we can do? We can actually speak words. And demonic forces has to obey us. We can speak words and demons have to bow down. The devil comes at us in our mind 
Oh yeah, I'm, I'm talking to somebody. And in your mind, he puts all kind of you know thoughts and, and and negative thoughts and tell you you're not gonna make this and you're not gonna be that. Come on, I'm not by myself. Stuff you stuff you overcame, he brings back to your mind. And you're sitting there allowing the enemy to run rampant through your mind. When Second Corinthians chapter ten verse four and five tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Right? And bringing every thought into the obedience, uh, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Casting down imaginations. I can speak words and the devil has to run out of my mind, out of my house, out of my family. Every I can speak words and I can clear the darkness out of my life because I'm speaking words over the strongholds. This has got a lot of Christians buried because you would rather sit there and think negative stuff and stay in that position instead of realizing you can speak yourself through by casting down those imaginations and realizing that if I speak the power and the word of God, then I know that I am walking in the masterpiece that God created me to be. So we should not be fearful. Uh, the devil will create a, fear, a stronghold of fear. But I heard God say that he has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. Then why are you running around with a spirit of fear everywhere you go? The devil will build, it's called stronghold. The devil will build a stronghold in your life telling you you're going to live in poverty and lack. Uh, God said, I'm, he said, no, break that stronghold by understanding that I shall supply all your needs according to your riches and glory. We got to learn to break the stronghold. The stronghold is just something the devil has put in our mind, but we can speak forth power and it will come forth and lastly as i hasten to this text watch this no don't ever be afraid to fight your battle as a masterpiece of god because here is the key god can at any time come along and pick up the pieces of our broken life see the devil lied to you he wants you to think that in this fight you're gonna get so badly bruised that you're not gonna be able to come back but do you remember when jeremiah took a trip down to the potter's house in jeremiah chapter 18 Verse 3 and 4, he said, Then I went to the potter's house, and he wrought a work on the wheel. And he said, As he was working with the clay, it got marred in the potter's hand. So the potter made another vessel as he wanted to make. Come on, understand what that's saying. I need somebody to go with me. Here's what he said. Where are the people that will testify? God made you over. Where are the people that can say, I was at the end of my rope, but somehow I turned around and I was refreshed and I was revived and I was renewed. I don't know how God made me over into this confident person when the devil had me all the way down. Has the enemy ever had his foot on top of your head, but you decided to hang in there? And somehow God came along like the potter and said, uh -uh, my job is to make you over. Some of us can celebrate today because that's what God did. Just like the masterpieces of Leonardo da Vinci were protected and preserved and valued. We are protected and preserved and valued by God. Value is about love. I can tell you this morning the reason God made you a masterpiece is because he loves you. Forget what other people say. It is the love of God. This man had uh, lost his job and he was... He was just upset by the way people treated him now that he was down and out. He got to the point where he had to panhandle while he was trying to wait for a job to come in. He had to panhandle. So when he went out on the streets, people looked down on him and they talked about him. And they just treated him real badly to the point that he said, I'm not going to do it anymore. But then he found out that there was a time he had to go out because his family was in need. So he went back out there that day, and sure enough, the people were just looking down on him, and you know, looking how, and he just didn't want to do it anymore. But he was praying to God, Lord, help me. And as he did, he was about to go in, and he got courage. He saw this one businessman coming, and it's almost like the Spirit of God. So he walked over to him and said, I need money. Immediately, this businessman dropped his bag, started searching frantically in his pockets, looked through his briefcase, just tore it upside down. Then looked at this man with sincerity and said, Brother, I am sorry. I don't have any money to give you. The man smiled and said, You gave me more than money. You called me brother. We are just like that man. 
as God's masterpieces, sometimes we're flawed. We mess up. We, we give in to the enemy. We fall on our faces. But God said, you're my masterpiece, flaws and all. And because this man valued who this person was, I want you to know God values you no matter where you are this morning. Can I go to this text? But can I tell you this? God values you because he created you with his own hand, piece by piece. Don't you ever fall apart and think God won't pick you back up and value you and love you because we are his masterpieces. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We've been created uh, and he led us in his family. And that's what this text is about. Write these three things down as we go into this text. I want to show you if you're going to be a masterpiece and walk around worthy of what God has done, there's three things you ought to remember. That's right. Come on, write it down. The first one is you were made alive. You were made alive. The second thing is you were actually positioned for authority. You were positioned for authority. You were positioned for authority and you are on a divine, you are on a divine mission. So you were made alive, you were positioned for authority, and you're on a divine mission with God. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. the book of Ephesians is one of the four prison epistles that Paul wrote when his first imprisonment in Rome. Like, Ro like Romans, uh, Ephesians was not written like the other letters to correct the problem within the church. Ephesians was written to show the greatness of the uh, doctrines and of the words of the church to show uh, how the, doc the great doctrines that God had placed in scripture the, the names of how we be, how we got saved, bringing us into to, uh, fellowship with God. Ephesians was written to, written to highlight this, these doctrines and highlight these great themes of the Bible. I, I know too many Christians that fall apart because you don't understand the themes of the Bible. You hear the words and we take the words, but doctrinal themes like a, adoption. In the first chapter of Ephesians, he talks about adoption. He, he talks about uh, understanding redemption, and he talks about understanding salvation by faith alone. And he gets into all of these great doc doctrines of Scripture. In chapter 1, he, he, he builds this biblical framework so we can understand who we are. And what's great about the book of Ephesians, it was established on Paul's second and third missionary journey, Acts 18, 19. But Paul had learned a lot by the time he went into his second and third missionary journey. Now watch this. As we talk about these great doctrines of the Bible, we found out that in that framework, the first thing we found out is he went to great pains to show us God chose us. You got to know chapter one before you can get to chapter two. In chapter one, he shows us that God created us. So the first thing I want to tell you is God, God's got a plan. Can I tell somebody that a lot of Christians don't understand that while you're sitting there worrying, God already got a plan. He went into Ephesians and said, don't worry about how you're going to get out. When God knew you were going to get in, he already had a plan. Because somebody said to me, God's got a plan. God's got a plan. I am so glad when I'm laying there worrying, I can remember that my God has a plan to get me out of my situation. So I just want to say this. Somebody said, well, how do you get to God's plan? The psalmist already told us. Be still and know that I'm God. But then in Ephesians chapter 2, it is one of the most powerful chapters because it shows us how we got saved, what God did to create that, and how he brought us into a place that we can walk around as his masterpieces. So the first thing it says is, you were made alive. In the King James, it says, quickened. You were made alive. I like that. He is saying that you were not you were made alive or you were changed from where who you were into something God wanted to make you. God took you and let you into his family. Made alive means that God had tried everything else to bring us to a place of stability, but then he decided to send his son down. Made alive means that I was invited into the family and I now enjoy that resurrection power that Jesus Christ already walked in. If you don't believe me, go back to chapter 1, verse 3, and it says, uh, uh, Blessed be the Lord and God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 and 3. This is what he said. 
in Christ. He blessed us in Christ with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Before God came along, we were just in us. But then after God came along, we were in Christ. Total night and day. It's one of those things where we have lost our ability to stay quickened or stay alive because over time we stop being excited about being in Christ. Matter of fact, there's too many times people would have gotten saved, but they looked around and saw too many sad folk in the church and said, I don't want none of that. But when we are in Christ, that's the key. In Christ, there's deliverance. In Christ, there is power. In Christ, there's strength. In us, there is none. So the first thing he said is, you got to stay excited about being alive. Come on. God said, there's too many of you, like the ten lepers. I healed ten. Nine kept running. But one came back and said, thank you. One was grateful. I'm telling somebody this morning, you want to get up out those dumps? You want to get to a place where you are walking in the anointing? Then you need to learn how to be grateful. Gratitude brings us into a place where we can touch the anointing of God. Be grateful. Quit worrying about what you don't have. Be grateful for what you do have. God's looking for saints that are walking around like Joshua on that seventh day, on that seventh time around the walls of Jericho when he shouted and the walls came coming down. Here's why. Because we got to understand when we're excited, we can touch God. God said, this is, you can't, this shouting stuff. When you guys walk around and say, I'm saved, that'll, that'll send you to a place that the enemy can't do anything in your life. Because I was made alive. What's mean by made alive? Uh, this man tells a story when he was younger, how his father had lost his job. Because someone on his father's firm had ran off with all the funds. And the father came home that night and said, look, I'm gonna have to go file bankruptcy tomorrow. And I don't know how we're gonna live. But his mother went out that next day and did something strange. She sold all of her jewelry and went out and bought all of this food and had a great big feast ready for the family that night. And the man came in and people started scolding her when they saw the table saying, why don't you spend all that money? I told you I'm going to be bankrupt. What's going on? And she said something that I want everybody to hear that has not gotten to the point that they understand how to stay quickened, how to stay alive. She said, wait a minute. You're hollering at me, but joy is for now, not for later. The time for joy is now. What am I telling you? The time for joy is not when things are going well. The time for joy is when you ain't when you have nothing. The time for joy is when it looks like the enemy is won. Somebody out there right now, you ought to have some joy because the time for joy is not when I'm waiting on God to do something. I'll be joyous then. No, get joyous now. She wanted them to stay excited. And he said her courage carried their family through. Then it said you were dead in trespasses and sins. Three things in that text happened to us when God made us alive. We had to get rid of being dead, we had to deal with the devil, and we had to deal with disobedience. Look at it, it's right there in the text. First of all, you were dead in trespasses and sins. I like that. You were dead in trespasses and sins, meaning that you did not understand what it meant to handle sin. You, you couldn't get away from sin. How do I say this? You were so dead in sin that sin had control over you. Sin sounded good. Sin looked good. We all were dead. We were dead to the things of God, and we were alive to sin, so sin felt okay. As a matter of fact, sin would speak to us and show us stuff. Here's what sin says. Sin says, you love her. She loves you. Y'all play to have sex. That's all. Wait, let me say something else. That's all sin says. Sin says, have sex. Make a baby. What's this? Sin will never say, be a good father. Sin will never say, make a commitment. Sin will never say, you're stronger than that. Sin will say, make a baby. If nobody will love you, go out, have some more sex. Make another baby. Make another child that won't be loved. As long as you're getting your gratification. Sin will tell you, go get high. But sin will never tell you, that getting high will lead to an addiction. Sin will tell you to be prideful. Look down on other people who don't have what you have. But sin will never tell you the same road took you up could take you back down. Sin will never tell you the people you're talking about now 
reciprocity. They may come. You may have to deal with the same thing. You better watch out. You reap what you sow. Sin will never tell you that. This woman came looking for her husband in the crack house. And the reason she was looking in the crack house, she ran in and stepped over bodies because she knew that's where he would be. She stepped over the bodies. And when she got there, she saw her husband sitting in the corner, getting hot. And the first thing out of her mouth was, why? Why? He put his head down. She said, can you tell me why? You see, their daughter had just died. They all were supposed to be at the undertaker's to see the body prepared. He went early, stole the shoes, the new shoes, off his daughter's feet, took them to the crack house, and got high. And the wife just said, why? And I want you to know, he showed us what sin can do. He told the truth. He looked at her and said, I don't know. I could not help myself. Come on, go talk about him. How many of us know we got some situations in our past where we look back and say, I don't know why I did what I did. I just couldn't help myself. That's what sin will grab you because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We could not get out. Sin calls us to not live like we should live. Next, it was the devil. Watch what it says here. So you were once walking under the power of the prince of the power and the, of the earl of the air, following the course of this world. So watch this. The devil, uh, you know, when we say the devil made me do it, we think that's a funny thing to say. But it's not funny when we say the devil made me do it. Because the devil is a trickster, but he also wants to destroy our life. You know the one thing the devil's mad about? The devil fights us because he is still mad about getting kicked out of heaven. So what he wants is for us to serve God more than we serve him. He will paint the picture so it looks good, so we will serve him. That's, it feeds his ego when you start following him, and we fall for it. And once he paints that, that road, once he shows us that goal, once he tells us how good stuff feels, as soon as we get to the point, he'll leave you high and dry. He starts his uh, kill, steal, and destroy stuff. What the devil does, he strings you along until he got you. Then he doesn't want you anymore because the devil is the opposite of love. He's the antithesis of love. The devil wants you to know that if you love me, I will in the end give you this. He'll promise you everything and give you nothing. Watch this. So how do I know nothing? It, you, it, it leads you, the devil leads you to a dead end street. What do you think Judas was thinking after the devil tricked him into selling Jesus Christ? Go with me for a minute. Think about that. Judas sold Jesus, heart got messed up, he went back to the temple, threw the 30 pieces of silver down. They wouldn't take it. But he was so far gone in the devil, that as he walked to hang himself on that tree, what do you think Judas was saying? I mean, what, what kind of language was he talking to himself as he was walking? I, I can almost tell you what he was saying. Can I, can I tell you? Nothing. You know why? Because at that point, he was too far gone. He was hopeless. Have you ever seen a suicide note? A suicide note has no glimmer of hope. They're not trying to talk themselves out of it. Here's the language of a suicide victim. They say, uh, I'm, tell somebody, I'm sorry. I just couldn't take it no more. I couldn't handle it. Uh, I, I, I can't deal with this. They, they have gone to a place of darkness, and the devil has them so far gone that they can't get out. Samson is, was an example of our next illustration that we have to deal with. You were dead, you got to deal with the devil, but then we got to deal with disobedience. Help somebody out, do you know that most of the problems in my life came because of my disobedience? Most of your problems, if you, would, if you, if you could own up, God could deliver you. If you would just say, if I could just sometimes keep my mouth shut. If I could just listen for God, I would be better. But disobedience will destroy us and disgrace us and take us to a place that we don't think disobedience is nothing. But Jesus said you were stuck. This word says that 
God made us alive because he had to take us from the death of our trespassing sins. He had to get us away from the devil. And then he had to teach us, you better walk in obedience. And God has a whole lot of ways of making us walk in obedience. Finally, King Frederick of Cilicia had just developed this new war plan for his men. So he said, my new plan, I need everybody to turn off their lights, their candles, I don't want any fires burning in your tent after a certain hour. After a certain hour. He started walking through the camp. And sure enough, he walked by one of the sergeant's tent and there was a light on. He walked in and said, what are you doing? And the sergeant said, uh, I just got done. I'm writing a letter to my wife. I love her so. He said, didn't you hear the orders? I didn't want any lights on. That it will destroy the plan. He said, sit down, sit down. Here's what I need you to do. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to understand something. I need you to understand. Sit down, open the letter, and I want you to dictate. I'm going to dictate some words to you that you're going to write in that letter because of what you did. And the man was obedient to the king, and he wrote, and honey, I will be hanged on the gallows tomorrow. I know, I know that sounds hard, but that's what the spirit of disobedience will do. It will get you to the point when you don't follow God, it ends up in death or disgrace or a place where you lose your destiny. Think about Samson. In his disobedience, he found himself tied to a gristmill. With all the strength he had, his act of disobedience. Think about Saul. His act of disobedience caused him to lose the throne and to lose his life. We think disobedience is a long thing, but God said, no, I quickened you as my masterpiece. You got to be able to overcome those things. Not only that, it tells us not you were given positional authority. Look at verse 6. And you he raised up, made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's the power of God's initiating. Can I tell you one of the greatest things in life? While you're sitting there sometimes sobbing, God is the one who would... I look back over my life, and God is the one who initiates all of my deliverance. He's an initiator. He, he raised us up to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He gave us a positional authority before we had practically figured it out. <laughs> think, about, think about how good God is to us. Because it says he does it by grace. Here's how God did it. He said, positionally, you, you, you know more sin will be counted against you, but practically, you got to learn how to walk worthy of the word. Positionally, um, you don't have to worry about sanctification because you're already sanctified, but practically, you got to sanctify yourself every day. Positionally, you should no longer have to worry about fear, but practically, you got to learn how to cast down fear. See, what Jesus did, we're raised up positionally because God is the initiator, but we need to understand that our authority as a masterpiece comes from God. Watch this. I, I, I tell a lot of stories about my dogs, right? And because you know I like to run, I like to walk. So as I was running and walking one day, I remember I've had a lot of them over the years, dogs chasing me, this dog doing this. And I, you know, if you run and walk as long as I have, you understand what I'm saying. Well, this one dog, I'll never forget, he would always get the best of me. And then I decided to exert myself and I'd walk by, you know, trying not to be fearful. And every now and then he'd get the best of me. But then one day I went home and I got this stick. And I keep it right up in there on my garage. So when I go out and I know I gotta go past that dog, he's dead by the way now. I would grab that stick. But let me tell you what would happen when I walked. When I had that stick, the dog would see the stick and he would back down. He wouldn't jump out at me anyway. And I figured out something. When I walked around with my stick, I was no longer just this bait for the big dog on the block. I happened to be the big dog on the block with my stick. My authority couldn't do it, but my stick could do it. What am I telling you? When Jesus went to the cross, he quickened us, raised us up. He gave us a stick. The stick that Jesus gave us says, when you're sick, call for the elders of the church. You got the stick that says, and the prayer of faith.
faith will raise them up. The stick says, when you have no money, the stick says, pray, and I will open the window and pour you out a blessing. See, the authority for us to walk around as masterpieces come from God. Somebody say, I'm a masterpiece. The authority is he raised us up in Christ Jesus. And I love it because he did it by grace. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. All of us should know to God be the glory for the things he has done. When you want to really walk in your authority, give God glory. Give God glory for everything that happens in your life and the power of God will rest on you. And the final thought is, right here in the text, takes us back to our main point. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Look at verse 10. His workmanship. You know, we like to talk about uh, by grace are you saved through faith and you know, that's the gift of God, not of yourself. That's any man should boast. All that's good because that leads us to the place that we have our authority, where it comes from. But this note of masterpiece says, I love it. It says we were preordained to walk in good works. God preordained that we are to have a good life. I'm his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Watch this. I should have a good life. I should be on assignment. Because I'm on assignment for God, I understand I've been made alive. Because I'm on assignment from God, I understand I have authority. Because I'm on assignment from God, I realize that I've been preordained. I need someone to get happy this morning. I want you to shout because the deliverance you're looking for has already been preordained. The deliverance that you thought would never come has already been preordained. Look at it. The masterpiece is because of the master. And since God preordained that I walk in good works, I'm going to shake this thing off that I'm in. Go ahead, take me out of here. I'm going to shake this thing off that I'm in. I'm going to get up and realize who I am and whose I am and what I am. Can I have the masterpieces rise up in here? Can I have those that understand who God is? Can you stand up and understand that my authority and my power has come from God? I am his workmanship. He put me together piece by piece. What I'm into did not come from something that God cannot handle. So I want you to understand something. I'm valued. I'm valuable to God. You're valuable to God. You're God's masterpiece. And I need you to rise up and understand. Give me a chorus of, oh, how I love Jesus. I want you to know this morning as we close, I love him because he first loved me. But I'll never let the enemy get the best of me when I know who and whose I am. So, no matter what you're going through, say to yourself, I am God's masterpiece, flaws and all. I'm here to stay and get victory. Let's pray. Father God, thank you today for everything that was said and done. Bless somebody to rise up and take dominion over their life, over their circumstances. Let them have an outlook of being excited about being alive, excited about being saved. And remember, you created us as your masterpiece. Now, if you're not saved, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I believe you died and rose again. Because I believe it, because I say, I am saved. Well, God bless you today. Hope you enjoyed this word. Tell somebody about the broadcast. Hit us up. Let us know if the word was doing you, if the word has blessed you today. And remember, Holy Spirit gave me this thought to tell you, you are somebody, somebody. You are God's masterpiece. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, 
and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. 